Several people have asked me about the Tesla brake booster that I'm using on my car, how it works, how to use it, and I haven't done a video on this yet because it's gonna be a super quick video. It's really easy to use. You just install it like a normal brake booster, and then you run these three wires to these look, oh, we're doing the intro graphic right now. Okay. Anyway, I know a lot of people on YouTube like to waste time shoving a bunch of crap into their videos that doesn't need to be there, trips to the store, and assembling things that are barely related to the project at hand. I occasionally get people who complain that I'm talking too much and not getting straight to the point, which I think is a little weird because I feel like I cram a lot of information into relatively short videos, but I understand that your time is valuable, and if you're one of those people that complains, this video is for you because I'm going to get straight to the point, not wasting any time. But first, let's talk about the history of brakes. A long time ago, back in the historical history times, vehicle brakes were simple. A stationary object, like a block of wood, was pressed against a rotating object, like a wheel. A driver could impart a great deal of stopping force using the mechanical advantage of a lever. Brake technology has advanced dramatically in the 100 plus years since the first automobile. Today's brakes work by pressing a stationary object against a rotating object using the mechanical advantage of a lever. Okay, so it's pretty much the same, but there have been a few significant changes. Hydraulic systems make distributing the braking force easier, but it doesn't really make braking easier. You can get a mechanical advantage from it, but it would be the same as just lengthening your brake pedal lever. There's no free energy. But then we found free energy. Someone realized that an internal combustion engine is essentially a really inefficient vacuum pump. When the engine is running, there's always a much lower air pressure inside the intake than there is outside. So make a big drum with a rubber membrane in the middle and hook it up to your engine intake. When you press the brakes, a valve opens between one side of the booster and the air. This gives you a difference in pressure between the two halves. The air pressure on the pedal side pushes on the membrane, which helps you push on the brake hydraulic system. This makes braking way easier because your engine is doing part of the work. Internal combustion engine cars suck, and EVs don't suck at all. That is to say, if you have an electric car, you don't have a vacuum pump under the hood. On the early Model S cars, Tesla solved this by putting a vacuum pump under the hood. They just used a regular old vacuum brake booster and connected it to a vacuum pump. This solution kind of sucked. But the technology for electric brake assist just wasn't there yet. I'm just kidding, it was totally there. In fact, my 4Runner has electric assist and it was made two and a half years before Tesla started making the Model S. I believe it's actually electrohydraulic. I'm not sure I didn't take it apart, but the point is that it doesn't need the vacuum of an internal combustion engine. So why did Tesla use this old technology? Well, I'm guessing it's because technology like this is made by suppliers, and suppliers love to have this conversation. Hi, this is Giant Automotive Company. We're designing a new car that will be out in five years, and we're going to sell a million of them. Can we use your coolest, newest technology for the brakes? They do not like to have this conversation. Hi, we're a startup in California that has made 1,200 cars in our entire existence. We'd like to use your coolest, newest technology for a car that may or may not exist. Our production timeline is comically short, and we have very little money. Hello? After a few months, this happened. And then this happened. And then Tesla started using Bosch's iBooster. They are currently on their second generation of this booster for the Model 3, and that's the one I have. So, how do you use this on your project car? I will tell you right after we take it apart. Whoa. So it is spring-loaded. So now we have three parts. One is the motor here. It has all the electronics inside for this part to control the system. I'm not going to take it apart because I don't know enough about electronics to make any sensible commentary. So we'll just say that this is where magic happens. This part is the mechanical part that actually does the assisting. This is where the magic happens. The third part is just some sort of cover that looks kind of like a baking pan. This just holds the spring in and keeps it all sealed up. I was pretty sure this thing was spring-loaded since you can see a spring inside of it, but I got excited and I wanted to take it apart. I really should have taken a break before I broke into my brake booster. Now I have a booster that's broken and it won't boost the brakes. But it might bake banana bread. Anyway, back to the magic. Here's what's going on. Let's say you don't have any electricity going to this thing. It's not doing any boosting. When you press the brake pedal, it pushes on this input here, which slides this whole thing forward here, and this little metal part pushes on your brake master cylinder. That pushes brake fluid into your calipers and makes you stop. These metal bars here are just to sort of keep everything in line. 
Pushing that brake fluid and squeezing the calipers takes some force, so as you push on the brake pedal, you get some resistance. Inside here, there's a spring, and as that spring squishes, there is a little bit of movement between the pedal input and the output going to the brakes. Inside this little black plastic thing here, there is a sensor, and attached to the input side is a magnet. I think, I'm guessing this is a magnet. Let's throw some metal shavings at it and see what, oh, yep, that's a magnet. So you push on the brakes, and the harder you push, the more the spring inside here squishes. As the spring squishes, this sensor measures how much it's squishing, so the system knows exactly how hard you are pressing on the brakes. Springs have a repeatable and linear relationship between their displacement and the force applied. This is called Hooke's Law, named after Robert Hooke. There are no surviving depictions of Robert Hooke, but he was said to be a not very attractive man. Hooke made numerous contributions to science and was a prolific inventor, but he was also kind of an asshole, and his rivalry with Isaac Newton, among others, meant that his legacy- You know, I feel like we're getting way off track here. Sorry, no more distractions. Anyway, the sensor can accurately measure the force that the driver is applying to the brakes. The system can then say, okay, the driver is pressing with 20 pounds of force, so I'm going to help with an extra 30 pounds of force, or whatever. It can even change the amount of assist based on other inputs like stability control or track mode or something. Theoretically, you could have a knob on your dash that just changes it to whatever you want. If you wanted to, you could change the spring inside here to make it lighter and then you'd get more assist. You could boost your booster. You might even be able to just take this part here and put it on your brake pedal and then disconnect your brake pedal from the booster entirely, only running wires between this sensor and your booster, then you'd have brake by wire. But don't do this. This is a terrible idea. Brake by wire is coming eventually, but let's wait for Bosch to figure out all the problems before we go sticking it on old cars. This sensor that measures the movement goes to this connector here on the bread pan, at least it normally does. Mine ripped apart when the spring decided to yeet the bread pan off the top. Brake booster. More like broken booster, am I right? So the sensor sees that you are pressing the brakes, and it knows how hard you're pressing on the brakes, so it helps you by spinning this motor. This in turn spins this gear, which spins this gear, which moves this assembly toward the brake master cylinder, helping you press the brakes. When you let off the brakes, the sensor moves back, the motor stops motoring, and the whole thing returns back to where it started. How does it return back to where it started? Well, you remember that big ass spring that exploded this whole thing apart? Yeah, that spring. This is all back drivable, so you don't need the motor to be turning forward and backward. It can just turn forward. It might be turning backward too, I don't know, but it doesn't seem to need to. This is all pretty straightforward, and it's also straightforward to make it work on any car. Here's how a vacuum booster works. Here's how a vacuum booster works. Sorry, I don't know why there was a pause in the middle there. Also spring-loaded. So this is the inside of a vacuum booster. This is the side that has the master cylinder on it. It has the port that goes to the intake manifold, so there's always vacuum over here. The other side is attached to the brake pedal. In between these two sides, there is a rubber membrane. This membrane has this sheet metal that moves with it. This is probably there so that the rubber moves in a predictable way, and also so that our friend, the big-ass spring, can press evenly on the rubber. This part here is where the magic happens. This rubber dust boot keeps the dirt and stuff out, but it has some holes in it so air can come in. Behind the boot is an air filter. We need this filter because when we press the brakes, air will come in this side and fill up this half of the brake booster. Behind that, we have this mechanism with two springs and some seals. It's a little hard to see how this works, so I'll show you a cartoon. When you're driving along in your car, your engine is pumping air, which creates a vacuum on the intake side. That is connected to the brake booster, which makes a vacuum on this side of the booster. When you're not pressing the brake pedal, there is a passageway for the vacuum to get to the other side of the booster as well, so it's all vacuum in here. When you press the brake pedal, this rod here moves forward and presses the master cylinder, which pushes brake fluid to your calipers and slows down the car. In a vacuum booster, two other things happen. The first thing is that this spring is compressed, which allows the seal to move and close off the passageway between the front of the booster and the back of the booster. After that, this stronger spring is compressed, which opens a passage through this filter and into the cabin. This causes air to move into the back half of the booster. So this side has a low pressure because of the engine, say five pounds per square inch. This side has the normal 15 pounds per square inch of pressure that we're all used to. 10 PSI of pressure difference over about 50 square inches means that your brake booster is pushing on your brakes with about 500 pounds of force, meaning your brake booster is way more jacked than you'll ever be. But these systems are not adjustable for different conditions or vehicle sensor inputs like the electric booster. 
Also, if your engine dies while you're driving, you get to use your brake booster once before all the vacuum is gone, and now you have to do all that stopping yourself. So the electric systems are better even if you don't have an electric vehicle, which is why you're seeing them in cars that aren't electric. It's also why you should consider using them in your project car. This car did not originally come with a vacuum booster, although they were common on many cars years before this one was built. It would, however, be many years after this car was built before electronics were good enough for electric brake assist, especially in England where they had unreliable Lucas Electronics. You know why the British drink warm beer? Because their refrigerators are made by Lucas. You know why the British drink warm beer? Because their refrigerators are made by Lucas. So you've got your booster, you've got your wiring harness that comes with it, and you're ready to make it work. What do we need to do? Well, I already told you. It's really easy to use. You just install it like a normal brake booster, and then you run these three wires. It was literally the first thing I said. Frankly, I don't even know why you're still watching. But since you're here, there are a few other things to keep in mind. You really need to get the wire harness with the booster. You can buy the plugs you need and run the wires yourself, but it's going to cost extra. If you have the harness, just run the fat black wire to the battery ground and the fat red wire to the battery positive with a 40 amp fuse in line. Then run the yellow wire to your switched 12 volt with a 5 amp fuse. If you don't have the harness, this is where the wires come from. You can buy the connectors and wire them yourself, or just get some blade connectors, shove them in there, and hope for the best. You'll also need to connect the wires from the sensor to the main controller. Again, this is already done in the harness, but if you don't have the harness, run these wires from the sensor plug to the controller plug. This is all for a second generation iBooster. The first generation is very similar, except that it has an extra wire that always has 12 volts and a 5 amp fuse. There is another thing that might be an issue. The reservoir is at a weird angle because the booster in the Tesla is mounted at an angle. So if your firewall is vertical, the reservoir won't work. The reservoir is different between the Model 3 and the Model Y, but they're both angled. There are two solutions to this, an easy one and a difficult one. If you're an avid follower of Superfast Matt, then you know which one I chose. I lathed out some adapters that are the same dimension as the two ports that extend out the bottom of the reservoir. Originally, I had threaded in some barbed fittings and ran hoses up to a reservoir here, but that looked terrible. So I bought some aluminum reservoirs, welded up the holes in the side, tapped the bottom, and threaded those on. I had a piece 3D printed to hold them together with a hose clamp. I drilled and tapped a hole in the top so I could make a hold down plate, otherwise these would just fall off. This is important, you don't want your reservoirs just randomly falling off. I'm sure there are also brake reservoirs out here for other cars that fit the spacing and size of the master cylinder. I don't know what they are, but if you know, let me know, and I will put the info in the description. You can also just use the whole booster from a Model S or a Model X. Those have reservoirs that will work. But those are the previous generation boosters. If you want the newest generation, you need one from the Model 3, Model Y, or... The easier solution is to just get the Gen 2 iBooster from a Honda Accord that is 2018 or newer. They use the same iBooster and have a small reservoir on the top going to a remote reservoir. They're also cheaper because they say Honda and not Tesla, even though they're both actually made by Bosch. So, in summary, to make a Tesla electric brake booster work in your car, you just need to buy a Honda Accord electric brake booster and run three wires. So there you have it. Straight to the point. No BS. No extra content. I am all about efficiency. What do you call the opposite of a fish out of water? Efficiency. Efficiency, efficiency.
By the way, there's merch. Because their refrigerators are made by Lucas. <laughs>